Friday, July 26, 1974. After breakfast, I cycled to the bank and got bait and fishing supplies. Later, Sally and I cycled to the visitor center. Elisa was at the stable. Leslie came out later with some friends in the Jeep. Sal and I schlepped across the dunes to the dune shack. Some friends were there with three kids and two dogs. They're staying there for a few days. Fished a little bit. Nothing. Later, we sat at the lookout and had wine and cheese. Then Sally, Leslie, and I walked back through the dunes. The dog was barking, and Leslie found a woman's body. Someone at the dune shack fetched the rangers and then gave us a ride back home. This is the diary entry of Lenny Metcalf, as read by Elisa Metcalf, his daughter. And the diary entry is part of the personal records of the Metcalf family that's associated with an unsolved homicide case called the Lady of the Dunes in Provincetown, Massachusetts. And that case has really lingered since 1974, which is now about 45 years later. The Cape Cod Times has been covering the Lady of the Dunes case since uh 1974, and the woman's body is buried uh, at the private church cemetery in Provincetown. So with each new police chief in Provincetown, there's always a renewed effort to get to the bottom of the case, and it dates back to, like, 1980. The body was exhumed for blood samples. In 2000, there was another, uh, the body was exhumed for DNA testing. There have been clay models, a clay model made of her head. A regression, age regression drawings to come up with a composite picture of what she might have looked like at that time. But in the last few months, the Cape and Islands District Attorney's Office has turned to um, what is a new use in the last year or so of DNA profiles combined with genealogy databases to try to come up with relatives, possible relatives of the Lady of the Dunes, Um, with the idea that maybe if you find a first, second, or third cousin through public genealogy data, that that person might ultimately lead to the identification of the Lady of the Dunes. District Attorney Michael O'Keefe told our newspaper that his office is currently looking at the extraction of DNA from what remains of the Lady of the Dunes, and that um, he said we're going to examine everything that we can with respect to what's left of the remains. This is a podcast by the Cape Cod Times about the Lady of the Dunes case and other unidentified bodies, skeletal parts, and cold cases in our region. My name's Mary Ann Bragg. I'm one of the reporters here. And with me today is Elisa Metcalf, who is a West Barnstable resident, a Provincetown summer resident throughout her childhood. She then lived full-time in Provincetown um, from 1989 to about 2016, And she has a unique connection to the Lady of the Dunes case. Her sister Leslie was the young woman at age 12 who actually found the body of the Lady of the Dunes. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Um, First of all, how is it that you and your family were in Provincetown in the summer of 1974? We had been going up to Provincetown summers for years since I was about three. My father was a pianist. And he, although we lived in New York City, um, he would get work in Provincetown in the summer times playing. He played for Lynn Carter and Waylon Flowers at the Madeira Club in the late 60s and early 70s. And that allowed the family to, um, you know, afford the luxury of being able to stay in Provincetown for the summer. So, like, what are some of your first early memories of Provincetown when you were... Well, the beach was great. Okay. Um, you know, we could pretty much walk anywhere. It was safe and warm and, you know, you didn't need any shoes. We were barefoot probably from, you know, July until Labor Day. Wow. And then you said you all would go out to the dune shacks with your your parents would go out or how did that work? Um, my parents had friends that rented one of the shacks 
for for several years in a row. Every summer they would rent it for about a week, and all of the friends, you know, a lot of the summer uh, summer residents and whatnot, we would gather there for that week. It was mm-hmm. you know an opportunity for everybody to hang out, enjoy the ocean and the beach and the dunes. Um, you know, multiple families with lots of kids. And you all would, sometimes you would get the ride out, but a lot of times you would trek across, like you'd ride your bikes from Provincetown to the visitor center. Then what would happen? Yes, because the only one family had a Jeep that could go off um, off road. Okay. So, of course, and it was owned by the people who were renting. And, um, you know, you needed supplies for the week. So, obviously, the, and there were, they had three kids. So, a lot of times it was, you know, rare that, that you could hitch a ride with them. So, for the most part, we would um, ride our bikes to the visitor center okay. and then hike across the dunes from there. Like, how long shack. would that have taken you to hike? Is it like 10 minutes? No, 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 no. Much longer. Half hour? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I was very young then. Um, so I don't, you know, your time sense changes yeah. as you get older. <laughs> but I think it was, it was probably closer to like a half an hour, um, you know, because you had to go. It wasn't a direct route because there was, you know, little scrub thickets yeah. of scrub pines and whatnot. So you'd have to get across uh, go around those. Would you follow a path, or no, or, yeah, just kind of. Actually, there there was a path in some places. I mean, I think I think that's how people used to get out there quite a bit. Um, so there was a path carved in in a lot of places. I remember. Okay, and this is one of the dune shacks. That's actually, I think there's like about fifteen or so out there now. Mm-hmm. They're right on the right on the bluff. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's it's moved since, coincidentally, I, I was just there um, in the fall. A friend um, a friend of a friend was, was staying there, and we had an opportunity to go out and see it. And they've moved it way back from the beach since then. And, okay. you know, the landscape <laughs> changes every year. But it was, you know, I hadn't been there since, you know, probably since this year, you know, this 1974. Yeah. Um, the, the family, after the body was found, they never rented the shack again. Oh, okay. So that particular week of this, when Leslie ended up finding the body, you, well, I think what you told me is that you were very much into horses at this particular time in your life. Yes. <laughs> and you still are, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so tell me about that, maybe that day or, yeah. So, yeah, I, you know, sometimes I would go to the beach with the family, but um, you know, there were other times where I preferred to go to the stables. So I would get up at the crack of dawn and go to Nelson's riding stable and just be around the horses all day until, you know, six or seven o'clock at night. Um, so I, I missed, um, and this day I, I missed the, the beach, but, um, so yeah, I was at the stables that day, fortunately, but my sister, um, you know, went to the beach with, with my family. As you understand it, what what happened that day? Um, I I remember just as my dad wrote that um, you know at the end of the afternoon they were getting ready to hike back, and one of the dogs that was staying at the shack followed them for a little bit and then took off and started barking at something. So my sister, being curious, kind of veered off away from my parents to go see what the dog was barking at. And um, I remember she said, you know, when she first saw it, she thought it was a deer just because of the coloring, Um, but then quickly realized, you know, it wasn't the shape of a deer or maybe some limbs came into, you know, her her line of vision before she Mm -hmm. had a a clear view. Um, And... She, my, as my mother used to tell the story, she remembers my sister going, Mom, Dad, and there was something in her voice, and my mother just grabbed my father's arm and said, Lenny, I'm not going over there. Like, go find out what she's talking about. Like, she just had a sense that there was something, something really wrong, and she, she was, you know, squeamish well not that you know seeing a body is a pretty heavy thing um i don't think you need to be squeamish to not want to experience that um but 
uh, you know, she just definitely did not want that in her memory bank. So my father went over there and and they saw, you know, they saw the body and then went back to the dune shack. They weren't that far from the dune shack, so they just went back to the dune shack and, and you know, got my my parents' friends, the adults there, and they took the Jeep to the ranger station and got the rangers. What did Leslie, what else did she see? She remembered that the clothes were neatly folded and placed under the woman's head um, and that her hands were missing. She saw that and that she was naked. I don't know if she, you know, I read read it read in the papers that, you know, the head was partially severed. I don't think that registered with her because I don't remember her talking about that. Um, but, you know, that she looked kind of peaceful, like she was just sleeping. I mean, I think if you, um, you know, she wasn't all that freaked out about it. You know, mm-hmm. if you come across a body that's like sprawled out from some violent oh, murder yeah. with, with blood, you know, I mean, yeah. that's probably going to stay with you. But this almost probably looked more like, you know, an open casket at a funeral because it was just laid out so peacefully. And and I think that, you know, it, it in a way was was good as far as like causing fewer nightmares. Okay. So tell us, you read the diary entry for the day where uh, Leslie found the body, but read us your dad's entry. I think you told me he was a pretty dry, he wasn't journaling so much, but he was a diary writer. So tell me, read the second day, the day after, and then just talk to us a little bit about Sure, yes, definitely not a journaler. Um, You know, if you want to know what the weather was on, you know, March 17th, 1957 this is a good a good place to get it but uh, you know for inner thoughts and and feelings um this is not <laughs> this is not where you'd go to to glean that kind of stuff so, all right saturday july 27th bit cloudy up at 10 15 haircut by chip at plaza on pearl street pancakes with sally and leslie elisa didn't go to the stables today Later, I took Leslie blue fishing, and she caught her first bluefish. I also got one. The motor quit, and we had to row home. Guy came to fill the gas tanks. I guess days, right? They filled our <laughs> gas tanks. Um, <laughs> They're still filling them. Right. I cooked the bluefish. We ate at 8.20. So... That was his entry. So I guess, you know, from, from that, he, I, su- I suspect, you know, that he, he purposely took my sister fishing to, you know, ease her mind or you know, that it, it was a, a thoughtful thing on his part to, to yeah. take her fishing and have that, that day with just the two of them together. And that I didn't go to the stables, you know, must have been a really big deal because I was always at the stables. <laughs> <laughs> so what did... How did they uh, tell you that they had found a woman's body that you remember? You were 10. Right. I don't specifically remember how they told me, but I I have a vague idea of, like, the feelings I had about it. Um, You know, first of all, being kind of shocked. Um, But, like, nobody was really horrified. Um, You know, it was... I don't want to say they're nonchalant about it, but, you know, it wasn't like, eek, there's this murderer running around, uh, you know, we have to lock our doors now. It was it was kind of like just something that, that happened. And, um, you know, my sister, she was a bit morbid <laughs> at, at times, too. She had, yeah. uh, you know, a bit of a, a morbid streak in her. So I think part of her was kind of fascinated by it. Um, and also, you know, being 12, that, you know, that's, that's a big spotlight on you. Everybody's asking you, you know, oh, wow, you found the body and asking questions. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and maybe, you know, on the outside, she seemed kind of cavalier about it, but, you know, I'm sure it affected her to, to some degree, but it, it, it did seem like, um, you know, being, being part, it was so 
Provincetown at the time was so peaceful. Uh, you know, there wasn't there wasn't much crime. There certainly wasn't murder. So it was, you know, it was a, a difficult time, but at the same time, it didn't really change anybody's life. Like, how do you think it, how did that kind of experience kind of trickle through the rest of your family's life for each member, would you say, or? I'm not really sure. Um well, the the family that rented the Dune Shack, I mean, and I didn't realize this until, you know, I was having this discussion recently with with um, the friend that she said, oh, we never went back to the Dunes. We never rented that Dune Shack again. Uh, and I didn't realize that. You know, it just kind of, then the next summer we never went and I never really gave it any thought. But, you know, I was working at the stables and those Dune tours, you know, we were taking the horses, you know, crowds of, um, you know, horseback riders through those same dunes multiple times a day. And I mean, maybe I just didn't make the connection, Mm -hmm. but it didn't seem like there was this fear that someone was going to come jumping out from behind the dune and, and murder you. It seemed like a very isolated incident for all of us. Were people talking about it? Then, oh sure. Or, were they asking you all details that you remember or um I don't specifically remember. I'm sure they did. You know, this at the stables were mostly local people that worked there, Provincetowners. Okay. Um so I'm sure there was some curiosity, but I wasn't there. So, you know, all I had was secondhand information. And I think the the newspaper pretty much covered it. There wasn't anything I could say beyond what um you know, what the papers reported. One of the things in talking with you, like as I've read the archives, it kept describing a young girl as walking her dog in all the newspaper stories. Yes. And you've, now you have refuted that. You've, you've clarified that one detail, which, mm-hmm. you know, I'm like, I don't know whether I've actually written it from having read those stories, but I do remember thinking it was, I like the fact that we've clarified that detail. And the other ones, the other details in the older stories seem to hold up based on what you've, Mm -hmm. like your family's direct experience. Right. Well, I don't remember anybody interviewing us, for instance. (laughs) You know, they probably just talked to the rangers. um, Oh, right. You know, and and that's what the rangers probably thought, you know. Yeah. Sure. 12-year-old girl walking her dog. Why not? I mean, that's certainly what it seemed like. What doesn't make that big of a difference to the story. As you think of it now, do you, people still talk about it from your perspective? Is it still, do you still hear people refer to it? And maybe why do you think it matters? Oh, sure. People talk about it all the time. And I mean, your paper reports it. Um, I remember years later being, you know, at a bar in New York and they had a TV on in the corner and a story came on. Maybe it was one of the anniversaries of the death and it was like the weekly world news and it was on there and I'm like, oh my God, that's, you know, that's the body my sister found. seems kind of odd to like have this attachment to something so like gruesome, but um, you know, there is, there is a connection. I think a lot of people in town feel a connection to this case, just because they want to know who is this woman. It's such a mystery. You were going to tell us maybe a little bit about your sister, oh. <laughs> if you wanted to. Sure. Um, she was probably one of the brightest, most creative people I've ever met. Somebody who could play instruments by ear. Um, she probably got that from my father. Uh, <laughs> he was a, a, quite a talented musician as well. Um, she, she wrote a lot. She drew a lot, um, everything from, you know, oil paintings to, uh, cartoons. Um, so yeah, like a creative genius, but also a little tortured. Uh, but, and I don't, I don't blame the woman on the dunes for that. I mean, I'm sure it didn't, it didn't. (laughs) No, no. <laughs> I can't blame her for all of that. I mean, some of, she, she battled with some depression um, over the time. And I mean, unfortunately, we, she, in 1996, she died of a heroin overdose. 
But she, you know, there were certainly ups and downs when she was up. She was really up and super creative and funny and fun to be with and um, very knowledgeable about a lot of different things. But then she'd have periods of, you know, great lows. And So did you and your sister ever talk about her finding the body after the fact as you all were growing up and later on? No, the, you know, the incident would come up from time to time, um, at different points in our life. And I remember as teenagers too, when we were older, maybe early twenties, teenagers, um, my sister and I would go to the the cemetery and visit the grave too. Like she Mm -hmm. definitely maintained this connection to her, to the lady in the dunes. So thank you so much. Listeners can find out more at capecodtimes.com forward slash Lady of the Dunes. And we're planning future Lady of the Dunes podcasts as well. So thank you so much for listening.